Well, let us begin our uh, discussion, Women in Energy Meet. Well, it'll be a fireside chat and we'll be covering the topics like empowering women, workforce in energy, transportation and technology space, advancing women leadership, time for change. We'll be talking about how, may, how can policy decision impact opportunities for women and contribution by key women leaders to the energy sector. Uh, so again, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm really honored and privileged to host such a powerful, amazing panel in the presence of all of you who all are wonderful, energetic women and some men, uh, some gentlemen behind. But as we all know that uh, India is uh, in the, on the path of sustainable uh, energy transition. Not just India, globally, everyone is talking about emission reduction and sustainability. And that is creating a lot of uh, new opportunities in the industry. Uh, there is a lot of focus on renewable energy, energy uh, electric mobility transition has already begun. There's a discussion about the green hydrogen. And that is opening, actually, all these things are opening a lot of opportunities in the sector. Uh, it is not just for the STEM, uh, science, technology, and uh, that uh, uh, field, but there are other ancillary uh, services as well, uh, where a lot of opportunities are uh, open now for the women to participate. Uh, I earlier as well talked about it, conventionally in the energy sector, the participation was around 20-22 percent. And we had also conducted a survey last year with uh, IFC about the participation of women in the industry. And that was, again, around 25%. Uh, even if the participation is lower in the conventional, but the renewable energy sector has increased that percentage. So in the renewable sector, the participation is around 33 34%. But that is not enough. Uh, we should have an equal opportunity. And there is a lot of scope for uh, this participation to grow. And what exactly we can do, what we can learn from the experience, and what could be some policy initiatives that can be taken on a uh, government level as well as corporate level, which will help us uh, accelerate this uh, participation in the coming time. So with this background, uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Tenuka Gera, Madam. Uh, you are the first woman board director at uh, Bharat Heavy Electrical Limited and uh, you are an industry veteran and brings industry experience of almost four decades. So that is really uh, great. And uh, you are heading various functions at uh, BHEL, marketing, business development, engineering, contract and project management, HR, administration, planning, finance, and legal. So you have covered entire <laughs> uh, ecosystem of the industry. So over to you for your opening remarks about your thoughts of a woman in energy. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure for me to see so many women, of course, a few men also. But it's really a pleasure, uh, let me tell you. When we uh, were growing up, it was very rare to come across, uh, I think, very handful of uh, ladies. In fact, I, when I was chatting with Madam Rashmi, a while ago, I was asking her, are we the two only veterans? And she said, no, there are one or two more. <laughs> <laughs> so when we started, like, it was the situation. But uh, thankfully, it has changed, changed much for the better. Today, in corporates like BHEL, uh, if I say, I don't think we have more than 5% total women workforce. But in executive cadre, we have around 10%. Mm -hmm. And if I look at equivalent uh, number of executive directors, which is the highest uh, level of, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, at executive uh, level. And then on the board, we still have around 10% ratio, which is very good. I think people have, when I became GM 10 years ago, so at that time I was the first GM from the engineering stream. So there's a lot of difference. I say things are picking up. But then I'm talking about a corporate uh, uh, public sector undertaking where mm -hmm. we give equal opportunities. We are very lucky that way that we got equal opportunities. Of course, we had to have our own determination and will to succeed. But still, there was no barrier as such. While in the industry and private sector, where we find so many women today working, I think it is important from policy perspective that we do insist on a couple of uh, things. For example, you know, uh, when a woman is growing up, you have to be supported 
not necessarily everybody has support at home. So if you need a child care leave or you need crash facility, I'm talking about very basics now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, skilling, skilling and, you know, being ahead of the technology, always uh, be with the latest in the technology. You need to be trained and skilled. So, the, I mean, special uh, emphasis has to be given on that. Further in STEM, as you rightly mentioned, they are in India, I think we have one of the highest uh, STEM graduates percentage of women. It's mm -hmm. about, I think, more than 40%. Yeah. <laughs> but in professional careers, the number is very low. It's, I think, less than 15%. Yeah. So this is the mismatch which we have to see how we are going to bridge this gap and what is the basic reason behind uh, having such a gap. But still, I am really enthused with the number of women and very enthusiastic young women who are uh, participating here and, and generally which I come across. Last uh, week, I was, I think last to last week, I was in Hanover where we had a stall in Germany. And a lot of women we found, they're also participating. And hydro, green hydrogen, as you said, they had one full hall which was dedicated for only green hydrogen. Hydrogen generally and various components, then uh, technologies, then cells, various types of technologies. So world is definitely moving in that direction. We all must get our act right. In BHL also we are trying to get into, uh, we, we have been there in renewable energy section. We have been a part of energy storage movement also. Now we are trying to get into hydrogen also and particularly green hydrogen. We are trying to set up a center of excellence in Banaras on green hydrogen after tying up with technology partners. So. Right now, this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renuka ji. And uh, yeah, it is uh, really surprising, or maybe for me, it is to, uh, just to know that only 5% women is there at BHL. And I will come back to you with uh, uh, policy level suggestions. You talked about the having a right workplace environment for women to participate. The basic today, thing. Out of but five uh, board members, I am one. So yeah, so that 10%, yeah. Got the opportunity. <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next we have uh, Jyoti Parikh, Madam, Executive Director, Integrated Research and Action for Development, Irade. And uh, she was a member of Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change India. Is a recipient of Nobel Peace Prize awarded to IPCC authors in 2007. She has been vocal on role and uh, involvement of states to meet indices on climate change for India, and she has a vast experience on energy and environment problems of the developing countries. So Jyoti ji, your views on women in energy, you have worked, you have again have a vast experience, and uh, you have also worked in other developing countries. So what would you say about uh, how we can promote and what is the situation right now? I think, so dear energetic women, um, it was nice to be here with all of you. This is very rare for me to have uh, be with so many women because I, when I was doing my career, very often one would end up being a lone person in, in, the, in the hall and that too from Asia. So uh, that was a double disadvantage perhaps. But I began my uh, career, actually I, I'm trained as a, my PhD is in theoretical physics, but I, started working in energy in uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna, and we lived there for eight years. So uh, that time we were making global energy models, and then we, uh, that gradually it went into climate change because global energy cannot discuss, we cannot have discussion on that without uh, climate change. So I, later on, I was chosen by the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But for uh, coming to India, <clears throat> uh, we have trained many PhD students doing thesis in, uh, in uh, carbon sequestration, ca climate mitigation, etc. But uh, uh, recently, not that recently, 2015, uh, we, we were, the Ministry of Environment and Forest invited us to do uh, some modeling work for India's NDC, uh, Nationally Determined Contributions, and from, that came, from there came the what we can do pathway towards 2030 and, and beyond. And uh, so the, this, this the goal of 35%, uh, first it was 35%, now Prime Minister has raised it to 50%, 
uh, uh, renewable energy share in India's energy uh, came from that. And uh, we uh, enjoyed doing that work. And now we are also doing net zero pathways. But uh, some of these uh, issues uh, will remain with us. And clearly, clean energy transition, uh, it's a, such a, a major challenge. And it's going to require technological change digitally. Uh, we have to uh, advance. We have to uh, socio-culturally also. It needs to a uh, lot of advancement. And all these can be, cannot be done without women's support. And we should see this as an integrated society. I just wrote that uh, you know, it takes two legs to walk. And if you think that only men can do it, they, they can go and hop. But uh, hopping is not the uh, way to uh, reach to, to very long dest destinations. So uh, we have to. So we have to uh, walk together, and um, uh, th this uh, energy storage is a very upcoming uh, and very necessary uh, uh, aspect of uh, clean energy transition. And we have to, uh, and in our, I was just mentioning that in our modeling work also, how much uh, one energy, one hour storage, two hour storage, four hour storage, etc. We need, and each time the technology will change. So uh, that way you can have some idea, uh, because finally uh, we are depending a lot on solar, and I'm glad it is that way. But it requires uh, enormous amount of, uh, uh, it's eight hours only, and so 16 hours. What do we do? Uh, it's a so a lot of. Uh, other hybrid sources as well as storage sources have to come in to make uh, energy supply reliable. But while we talk about uh, these um, advances in energy system, uh, I also decided to spend 10 or 10 percent, 20 percent of my time also in uh, gender and energy. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it seemed very strange to me being from a main energy so, uh, 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 I mean, field that um, you know something so simple as cooking requires so much uh, to, to 2.5 billion uh, households don't have a three, it was three, probably still three, but uh, now they say it's reduced to 2.7 billion households, uh, people are without access to clean energy. And all that is left to women to handle. And she is this full supply chain from gathering the so things, from transporting, from uh, storing, and from uh, processing, maybe some species or drying or this and that. So processing is also takes time. And then finally cooking with it, which, uh, which uh, has so much air pollution. So I mean, there is a health and hardship issues all through the chain. And, uh, uh, and so much energy, uh, uh, you know, in investments are going in so many things. And this is a very small issue, frankly. Uh, uh, if you really, it's a big issue, but at the same time, if from investment and import purposes, it's not that big. Uh, when you spend thousands of crores for, uh, you know, uh, one gigawatt of uh, power plant, uh, you know, it's just a few, few uh, gigawatt will take care of so much investments and imports needed for, for uh, cooking. And so induction cooking and so on, now we are also working on that. and. Uh, uh, yeah, so how to integrate uh, the means, I mean, we are fine, we are doing a, a upfront energy uh, work, but at the same time, a uh, lot of our uh, other uh, people are, are be, uh, left behind, and we should ensure that they also march with us, and that, that's our responsibility as some people who have uh, had an opportunity to advance. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti ji. Uh
and you you covered the point that when we talk about women in energy it is not just the gigawatt scale or the megawatt scale that we are talking about the uh, country level uh, energy uh, integration or renewable ent energy integration it is also about the energy access that we have to consider and there is a lot of scope to work uh, in that sector right from the uh, raising the microgrids uh, setting up the microgrids mini grids to clean cooking and there the woman is going to uh, play a role of a uh, consumer decision maker and uh, even the implementer so uh, we are also working in the state of jharkhand where uh, we are working with a set of uh, women didis and they now are feeling very pride to run that uh, microgrid run dal processing unit and then taking pride to have that uh, economic development activity and they do proudly talk about how it has changed their lives and it is very uh, nice to know about now we are moving uh, energy planning side women in the energy planning side uh, so seema madam chief engineer central electricity authority uh, and ca as you we all are aware that advisory body to the government on policy matters and formulating plan for development of electric systems uh, seema madam you have been instrumental in promoting uh, research pertaining to generation transmission and distribution as well as implementation of national power data management system so over to you how do you see a uh, uh, woman in a planning commission or the planning uh, side of the uh, energy uh, systems oh, well i like to start from my college days Uh, i passed out from motilal nehru engineering college alabad at that time that college is used to have lot of scientists lot of violence and in fact central government education minister came to our college after murders have taken place that we are still to find a principal who can take the responsibility of mnit alabad for one year there was no principal in our college total violence all the rapist all the bank robbers and even alabad is close to the forest area where chandshekhar had died a dense forest so a lot of all the up gunders used to hide there that was a college it taught me very one thing lots of thing first of all you should not be afraid of anything there were very few girls and uh, secondly it taught me that since there are a lot of sign dies in i think second year we had only 10 maximum class in a year so it taught us how to study ourselves it was a first central government central university in india and lot of facilities like uh, books were there libraries were there people all the students stop us from all the I mean, it at that time was number one regional engineering college in india and all the people from toppers were there from the states so students were very good but there was no teacher so imagine passing from that college it was like that so it taught me one thing that you have you you should not be afraid of anything the first in my college was a lathi jo mere dupatte se gayi it taught me like that so i said no problems second day we were standing there jahan pe khade the usi din wah murder ho gaya so things were like that uh, we were used to it hamare dean ko kisi ne maar diya he was in hospital for one day so it was a common thing koi hospital pahunchega koi udhar hoga but it was one thing that you have to continue and that is the hard work there was lot of unity among us day and night we used to share our uh, knowledge kahan se padhe kidhar se padhe it kanpur ne yahan se padha hai it bhu ne yahan se padha hai that was a thing that we had the concept teachers to padhe hi nahi hai in second year we had no teachers but it taught us how to become self educated and which carried me in ca itself it taught us that teachers are not required you have to be a teacher yourself you have to find out where the knowledge has to be gained and ultimately it is the objective so with that in uh, base things were very easy for me i joined i indian airlines as i said first woman engineer in maintenance i left that i joined you through upsc ca here in ca this type of background was very helpful i have worked in number of places my as there has been whichever division there has been problem i have been posted there and uh, in fact i can say ki i enjoyed my work it was at the peak of the wherever it was the delivery was required i was there 
so variety of jobs i have got variety of uh, opportunities challenges and i have enjoyed a lot so first message for the ladies is there don't be afraid of anything secondly the power lies within you learn to realize your talent work hard nothing is over the intelligence if you have a good iq if you can deliver then nothing can overcome it i have seen that never in my life i got after that i never in my life i got the thing ki gender based वैसे भी गवर्नमेंट में देयर इज नो जेंडर बेस्ड इज ओनली अ चेयर बट इवन इन इंजीनियरिंग कॉलेज इट वाज नॉट लाइक दैट सो दैट इज माय फर्स्ट थिंग नो एज शी इज टॉकिंग अबाउट प्लानिंग इन सीए वेल टुडे आई एम पोस्टेड इन ह्यूमन रिसोर्स डेवलपमेंट सो इन गवर्नमेंट यू हैव द हियरकी यू कैन ओनली टॉक अबाउट योरसेल्फ इन व्हिच डिवीजन यू आर पोस्टेड व्हिच आई हैव ऑलरेडी ईमेल टू दिस थिंग आई कैन नॉट टॉक अबाउट द अदर सब्जेक्ट्स बिकॉज़ ऑफिशियली वेयरएवर यू आर डिजाइनेटेड कैन स्पीक ऑन दैट but i can talk about the past i've been uh, linked with lot of thing for electrical vehicles storage 2 3 years i worked a lot for that and uh, as part of ca we had even gone to i uh, i cat in maneswar we had tried to promote the best design giving them or something so that was a story which everybody is aware and uh, most of the people who have been in energy sector they have been available for two, till 2019 i was here now as in one resource development i am in the implementing stage i am ensuring that uh, mandatory curriculum which people have to follow for the load dispatchers for the generation for the transmission or distribution that electrical vehicle renewables storage should be compulsory be a part of the topic in their curriculum so anybody who joins the any organization which is generating transmitting or trading or even load dispatcher that is posoko or the state dispatcher they have to learn the this is a basic uh, this thing common course that is renewables energy storage vehicles because it is now going to be a part of life just as mobile is a part of life you will find that solar is part of life every corner when you are moving in pune i'll say you'll see small uh, shops out there they'll be having that uh, solar panels in there they'll open the light they will uh, use it and at night they'll go off so things are changing a lot and this is going to become a day to day activity people have to run to realize the conservation of energy how to use it uh, economically and that starts from the people who are themselves are in the industry so as human resource development these days i am ensuring that it's like a mandatory course and people go about it as for the planning ca is trying to make it transparent we are uh, trying our data system whatever the load uh, data ca was famous for collecting data because nobody can refuse data to ca that we have made it mandate uh, that we have opened the portal it was a quite difficult task but now transparent is there you can see all the data that is available what is the load factors what is the transmission what is everything is available now on the this thing in the ease of doing business we are trying to get everything on the portal even what grid operator posoko is doing that has also come online that you are aware another last 2 3 months back it has been done selling and buying an extra surplus power is already being shown so that is the ca role we are trying our best that transparency comes into the picture and as far as networking is said i will just say that yes you will have to fight for it because uh, women are in minority that will stay there but i hope you are able to overcome that that's all thank you thank you sima ji thanks for sharing those uh, initiatives uh from energy let's move on to the automotive sector and uh, we have two uh, leaders from the automotive sector uh so dr rashmi urdwashe independent director arai and uh, she is former first woman director of automotive research association india's premier automotive and r&d testing organization she is also recipient of prestigious nari shakti puraskar instituted by the ministry of women and child development as a national award in recognition of exceptional work for women empowerment so rashmi ji how do you see how do you see the empowerment is uh, actually happening in the country and more so on the how how we can increase the participation of women in the automotive sector and now the electric mobility 
Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for that introduction and that question, Netra. Uh, I have seen automotive world uh, over the last four decades. And uh, uh, well, um, similar to what uh, Sima said earlier, I also joined uh, um, an engineering college which was male dominated and you know the struggle was really very re uh, real. Uh, I joined AIRA as a trainee engineer as a supportive role in the testing and uh, uh, the kind of instrumentation development. And soon, um, over one and two decades, there came a requirement of uh, designing a first electronically controlled engine. So that's where the role got shifted from a supportive test testing side into real design capabilities that I had learned earlier in engineering colleges got to be applied onto automotive. Um, so that's the history. And then coming in, I have also seen uh, some of the uh, capabilities that women engineers do develop are in terms of simulation, electronic controls, electrical engineer, in engineering, and so on and so forth. So in today's scenario, these skills are very, very relevant if we are talking about electric mobility and even energy management. So um, I think it's, there is there's a huge opportunity opening up for women uh, who have acquired or who wish to uh, expand into this domain of electrification, power management, uh, Renuka ji talked about hydrogen, and that's also one reason uh, why, you know, ke even chemical engineering used to be dominated by women earlier. So there is a huge opportunity for researchers to work in the space of uh, not just uh, energy, but also automotive, and then of course expanding it into manufacturing. Um, we have a strength uh, in the STEM educated uh, community where women are dominating these uh, disciplines. So I think that's uh, there's a clear realization at all levels. All the corporates you will see that they're welcoming uh, these trends uh, with open heart. There are new opportunities which are opening up and I think we should, we should look at it as a new um, uh, complete era opening up for the skills which earlier were seen to be female um, dominated skills. So <clears throat> that's a positive sign. Um, coming to how do we encourage women, I think um, we, should, uh, we should take this forward that we should encash upon our strengths. Sustainability and energy efficiency are women's strengths. Um, we all belong to this uh, energy conservation mindset. Um, so that gives us another opportunity to make our impact. Uh, there are multiple ways in which we should encash upon um, our own skills of um, um, artificial intelligence, simulation tools, and the third topmost is knowledge management. Um, which are not just into automotive, uh, they go uh, all the way up to manufacturing and all the other sectors as well. So, I mean, sky is the limit. Yes, sky is the limit. And as you said that sustainability and energy efficiency are the strengths uh, that a woman already has. And uh, we can, uh, without taking more time, actually, I am getting some signals that uh, our dinner will be uh, served soon, and then there is a <laughs> uh, felicitation which is going to happen. Uh, but Sulajja, uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for taking time uh, for joining us. You come from uh, actually business uh, family background, but Kinetic Green is your own baby. And uh, that is what you have taken to a level where it has been appreciated by the industry. Uh, so Sulajja is CEO and founder of Kinetic Green, one of the leading manufacturers of electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers in India. And she's also the vice per chairperson of Kinetic Engineering and is responsible for Kinetic Group's overall business strategy. 
so how exactly kinetic group is uh, uh, making sure in their policies that how women uh, participation uh, can be increased uh, in the industry if you can highlight some of those uh, initiatives a uh, very good evening to all of you uh, first of all thank you to rahul and netra for inviting us here sure. it's a pleasure to be part of this wonderful gathering um i came with because of your invitation but i'm really glad i did because i've already met some really wonderful women here so very happy to be here also congratulations to all you ladies who are here today uh, maybe you know you don't realize we don't realize but uh, we are part of two very disruptive themes which are going to drive the future one is that the future is green and the future is inclusive and all of you here are sitting in areas like green energy and leading in your fields are actually pioneers in your own way leading to very big disruptions in the world so congratulations to all of you and my best wishes to each and every one of you now coming to the question that you asked netra um as she mentioned kinetic green is an electric vehicle manufacturer one of the pioneering companies in this field of course kinetic group as such has been a pioneer in automobile industry some of you will remember kinetic luna kinetic honda and along the way we've also developed many other system level capabilities within our group uh, but kinetic green is one of india's leading and uh, pioneering electric vehicle maker now why i think that this is um, an interesting time for automobile industry is because i think that ev actually is truly bringing about a big disruption so i call it a fender and a gender disruption if you see the automobile industry amongst all industries all manufacturing industries also is the most male dominated there are very few women in automotive industry i mean much lower than the 20% numbers that you quoted for energy right it's single digits and the women typically who are in automotive industry have been in areas like finance advertising marketing hr but not in really the core r&d engineering development and on the assembly line this has been throughout the world whether it's developed markets or developing nations but i think ev electric mobility is one trend that is changing all that and i believe that change creates opportunities right so i'll give you some examples and i'll quote examples from our own group so electric vehicles are more about electronics and software and less about you know hardcore um, uh, mechanical mm. mechanical engineering mechanical assembly and that's driving this change um, on our assembly lines uh, uh, and also electric vehicles are easier to assemble because there is no engine so the vehicle assembly is a simpler process uh you don't have on the manufacturing floor you don't have forging and casting and machining and heat treatment and all of those um let's say physically challenging activities and the vehicle assembly is quite simple because you typically buy out or develop in another place your sub sub uh, systems or aggregates like your motor your controller your battery your charger so vehicle assembly has much fewer parts and as a result we are seeing more and more women actually on the shop floor in kinetic green you know even in our own two wheeler assembly we have 25% women there are other companies like ola electric piaggio who are also welcoming women on the assembly floor this is unprecedented in automobiles uh, so this is one big trend but more importantly now if i go back into the subsystem level work even ev components are more about electronics electrical and software and less about only in the machine components so there are a lot of women even at the subsystem level and uh, one of our group companies is called kinetic communications which makes electronic uh, components and assemblies for evs they actually have smt factories where we print the pcb boards and then forward integrate them into products like digital clusters and controllers and converters and very proudly i want to say that rashmi ma'am is on the board of this company uh, kinetic communications and we have 100% women on the shop floor she has seen she will vouch for it we have another group company which makes electric traction motors and small dc motors for various automotive applications um, and there also we have more than 60 70% women on the shop floor so the moment you have more and more of software electronics electricals women are entering into these areas now coming to core of r&d also 
I think there is a big shortage of skills in e-mobility. And I think that creates an opportunity for men, women to also enter these core areas. And I think as the world is going to disruptively go electric, from 5%, it's going to be 50, 60, 70% electric over the next decade, which is an unprecedented growth. It's like all landlines went to mobile phones in five years, something like that. It's going to be a rapid transformation. Skills are going to be required. So if we can identify that there are, there's a shortage of skills, deficit of skills in uh, battery R&D, we have Gayatri who leads uh, one of the leading, uh, she's the CTO of one of the leading battery makers. Um, so battery, BMS, motors, controllers, hardcore R&D battery chemistry is going to require skills. So we can think about these areas which are going to create opportunities and new skills are required. And I think for sure women in STEM can equip them with these skills which are going to be short in demand. And because you're equipped with skills which are in demand, which people don't have, men don't have, some men may not have, it could be more opportunities. So I think e-mobility is creating new opportunities. And I think if I combine e-mobility with green energy, I think it is creating a transformation. I don't know how many of you have seen, if you have gone to California, you see these Venmo cars, there's autonomous cars, actually on streets of California. So there are driverless autonomous cars, taxis running on the streets, and they're getting charged under solar roofs automatically. This, I mean, this is completely transformational. And I think even EVs are going to go green well to wheel. That's when we'll really be green. So the, there is going to be more and more adoption of green energy to charge electric vehicles, solar energy, wind energy. So there's going to be a massive transformation in which the way we produce automobiles, the way we ride automobiles, the way we deploy automobiles, the way we power those automobiles. And this cusp of green energy with e-mobility is going to create a transformation. So once again, I think change and disruption creates new opportunities. And definitely, we as women can capitalize them. Um, and you know, there is a great, you know, there's a great uh, sea of such opportunities. So at the end, I would say, let's boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. And best wishes to all of you. Thanks, Suleja. So that is very interesting. And uh, one common question uh, <laughs> to all of you. So why it is important to have uh, women leaders in the organization? So we talk about women bring a different perspective. So there are some strengths uh, and we have to, uh, I mean, men and women in an organization. So there could be some complementary strengths, some supporting uh, strengths. but. Uh, women bring different perspective to the table that has been discussed. So can any of you share any incidents where uh, this, this can be uh, talked about as a story or uh, why, why it is important to have a woman at the leadership level in the organization? Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah. We don't talk of any specific story, but I can tell you when there is a woman on the table, first of all, the quality of discussion improves much, much. I mean, okay. <laughs> you leave all the men on the we table. We all agree. And what they are talking, it's <laughs> a different. lot of hands. <laughs> so even UN admits that corporate governance is much better if you have uh, women in the governing bodies. But that apart, I think women are extremely, extremely good at uh, multitasking, which I have not seen men do. So they'll be simultaneously doing. I think you would have seen at home, and you were handling six things where the male member may not be even good at handling two things together. So this is a very, very, uh, and then they are more collaborative instead of competitive. And then all of us are very good at bargaining. You know that when you go to the <laughs> market. So brokering a deal by a woman member is much easier than if when you have a man. It becomes more egoistic if you have a man around. So I think we are good at negotiating, good at multitasking. So that's one reason why women should be there definitely. That's okay. my perspective. And diversity and inclusion always has been a value uh, which uh, uh, our cultures uh, have nurtured earlier. Somewhere we dropped it and now it's time again we talk about it. Uh, the corporate uh, citizens, um, they are looking. It's not that nobody wants uh, women. It's just the lack of right skills. Yeah, availability of the right skills at right levels is what is the issue. 
Uh, I think we should not talk uh, uh, about the relevance. It is all relevant, everybody knows that women have uh, very different uh, skill sets and they are needed at board levels, they are needed at uh, top management as well as at all other levels. I think we have to understand uh, that women hold back sometimes. Uh, they don't realize their true potential. They don't, uh, um, you know, um, as uh, Renuka ji was saying, they are collaborative in nature. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they would never go and ask for a position. So um, corporates ha are realizing this and they are inviting participation in a full, um, fair way. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is a cultural change which is happening. Um, in my view, I have always seen uh, that um, during my four decades of automotive, I was never seen as any different uh, than any other person. Just because I was very professionally qualified, I behaved professionally equal to any other male colleague. So that is something which stands by itself. Uh, here I will say something uh, from my own experience itself. Being a lady, there's one thing, you're not running the home. And in a, if you're in a government job, corruption is there, you're able to speak your mind because you know if you're fired or if you're terminated, then your family is not in problem. So you're able to fight back more. You can speak your words, I'll stay with that because when I was in the starting, Debol, power project and fast, eight, nine fast track projects had been sanctioned by Prime Minister of India. They were interested, IS officers were interested, media was interested. And I was new to the organization as an assistant director. I had done all the load flow studies from the right, from the transmission angle, generation angle, going into the NIC. When I wrote my noting, all these nine fast track projects were gone. Nobody, and the noting was so strong that nobody could write till the chairman, nobody could change it. CA suffered on that account. Lots of uh, people wanted CA to close down. But my positive point I will say is I could boldly write it down because I knew my job is not only, not only CA doesn't make a difference, I can go somewhere else also. So that is the one positive point that the ladies have in their life. Thank you. I won't add a lot because I think the panelists have really given a lot of insights. I'll just say two things. I'll say number one, we are not robots. I think diversity and different viewpoints is what leads to rich discussions and better decision making. Imagine if it were just men and they were all the same. Same age, same background, same mindset, same everything. Would it lead to better decision making? It would not. So just as people from different backgrounds, different education, different qualification, bring diversity, I think women also have a great value in terms of diversity, different viewpoints, different expertise, different mindsets that can enrich discussion, dialogue and decision making. This I think is first and foremost. Secondly, half of the consumers in the world are women. World is half women. So if half of your consumer's voice or mindset is not in your organization, then aren't you losing out on some very important insights? So I think the fact that women are important consumers, even in automobiles, large number of con percentage of consumers are women and they're also influencers. So I think having more and more women will also bring a better understanding of a large part of the customer base. So I think these two insights of diverse, diverse, diversity bringing better uh, decision making and diversity bringing better insight into your customers, I think are two very important reasons why people will greatly benefit by having this valuable resource in their company. So I believe. Sure. So maybe for innovative thinking, innovative solutions, diversity is important and women bring that diversity to the table. Right scale women can bring that diversity and then better decisions can be taken and betterment of the overall uh, business. Would anyone like to ask anything to the panel? Sure.
think it's interesting because there may have been many, many things which we could have done differently. You know, post facto, we always say everybody is wiser. <laughs> so that aside, I think uh, the biggest challenge for me in the leadership position, I would say when I became general manager, I wanted to take on the hardcore project work which my male colleagues were doing, like the site work. So I already was a project manager for a very large size project. But then I, to that I wanted to add the site, uh, because at site you have you know, thousands of labels and every day, every day, believe me, you would have several, several issues. I used to get uh, phone calls till late in the night, 10, 30, 11 also, and you needed to resolve it immediately. The decision making had to be quick. We don't want the work to be halted at sites. So I think this kind of challenges is something which we all must aspire to take. And it has given me a lot of insight. An organization, particularly our kinds, either we are into manufacturing hard code or we are handling the project execution. So you have to dirty your hands. You need to understand. You have to get to the roots of the, you know, of how, where, or what is the main strength of your organization. And then only you can uh, hope to reap benefits. So doing differently, maybe I could have, uh, you know, had a manufacturing unit also. I miss doing that. But uh, it was late by the time I was already on board, so that is uh, one regret. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll say a little, uh, let's say, a um, more emotional one. I think for me, the biggest challenge was uh, when I became a mother. Um, I come from a business background, business is in my blood. I was always been very ambitious very passionate about kinetic and automobiles. Went to the US, came back, very focused. This is what I want to do. I want to make it big, all of that. Uh, an automobile is a complex industry. Uh, there's a lot of facets to it. Um, anyway, at the top, an entrepreneur, you know, it's always, there's a lot more stress than when you're an employee. You're taking a lot more pressure, a lot of challenges, travel, all of that, yeah? So enjoying all this, and then I became a mother. And I think that was the, probably the most difficult moment in my life when I really wanted to be with my baby. And I really wanted to be back at work as well. And um, um, I think that um, it took me a few, I took only four days off, incidentally. But it took me those four days to decide that both are very important to me, to be a mother and to be a good uh, professional or a whatever entrepreneur. And then I had to literally manifest a lot of energy and strength and mental strength inside me to say that, no, I'm going to you know, do whatever it takes to be good at both, do my best, find solutions and uh, continue uh, you know, my journey. Um, and I think that in the hindsight, it was the best decision I took because I felt that if I had slowed down, then I probably would have, you know, um, derailed a little bit. But if I didn't also give the same amount of time to uh, or energy, uh, attention to being a mother, then I would have felt um, uneasy. So I, I, I made that decision that yes, it's going to be hard, but it's my decision because I want both of it. And the moment it was my decision that I want to do it, then you know it all became worth it. But I think that was difficult for me to leave my little baby and work and all of that. It was difficult, honestly. Yes, can totally relate to it because even as an employee, if you do something with the ownership, then it is really difficult to stay away from work as well as away from baby. So that is something I think each uh, new mother must have faced that uh, dilemma. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yes. So I, there are there are always new challenges. It is not just with the newborn baby. You have to strike the work -life balance. Balances, and that is where I think family support comes into picture, and that is so valuable at such a point. I would uh, like to share my challenge. Uh, I was a technocrat. Uh, always enjoyed working on research and development and the projects. Uh, I was heading departments which involved a deep technical development at vehicle level. And then in 2014, I was uh, uh, chosen 
to lead the organization and I became the director of ARA. All of a sudden, there was a change of role from a technocrat to a CEO, which needed very different skills altogether. And I realized that, uh, you know, while of course it is a taken thing that I would continue contributing in my technical way, much more is required. So the first thing, uh, I, I drew up a 100-day plan. The first thing on that plan was to learn uh, to uh, scientifically read and write a balance sheet. So I learned it. Any, yeah, I think there's one more. I think just, yeah, last question, and maybe we can. Hi, I'm Raga Madhuri from MTU India, Pune. Uh, thank you for the wonderful conversation. I think I can do this listening to all of you speak for the entire day. I'm not even tired end of the day. Uh, thank you, I suffer actually organizing this. Um, Netra, thank you. You just mentioned about family support and that's exactly my question. Uh, thankfully, I have very good support uh, from my family, my parents and my husband, they are very supportive right now. He's working from home, taking care of my two daughters when I'm attending this event. So I'm blessed that way and many of us are probably. Uh, but my question to any of you who would like to answer is, I come across many women who do not have that support but are very ambitious, very passionate, probably more than ever I was. What is that advice that you can give? Because they can fight the world, but family is where they won't be able to take up that fight. So at work, if a boss is saying, you're a woman, you can't do it, then they're obviously going to take it as a challenge and probably deliver 200%. But at home, if they don't get the support from, say, partner, husband, or uh, mother-in-law, whoever it is, they are weak in their knees any advice that I can pass on to some of my friends who are going through this? I think it's, uh, it's a real struggle and it uh, sets in a lot of uh, um, discussion points, uh, but uh, a few comments I would like to make. Uh, not everybody is fortunate to have uh, strong support um, I happen to have be uh, very fortunate because I left my one and a half uh, year old son in care of my family uh, for six months. I was away in Germany for a fellowship. So I understand and I can relate to what you are saying. So developing, I think, the support system, it could be by extended family, it could be by friends, it could be for the services that are available. Um, that's one way. Second is, uh, go ahead and take a break, um, and uh, it doesn't halt life. Uh, we should be bold enough to take breaks. Um, get back to uh, your uh, work. Uh, it may not be the same work. It may be different level altogether, but don't make compromises on personal commitments. Uh, so that's a second advice. And the third one is, um, nobody waits for you. Um, so uh, you have to decide on your own priorities. Um, the priorities can change. I mean, there's no single formula as such that would work. So uh, go and get driven by your own values and your priorities. So Chandra Nui's book talks a lot about creating this uh, structure of uh, support. And then uh, there are organizations which can create a, a workplace uh, environment which can be inclusive some i know that uh, some large it companies are having baby care at the uh, facility at the at the in the building so such things are there and as madam said that uh, take a break so coming back from the break is also difficult so some organizations do have policies to bring mothers back in the workforce system so i think such policies may be helpful in coming time at the same time, I guess, uh, we have to work on skilling up ourselves because when you take a break, there may be a time that you have to acquire new skill sets to join back. So I think that is up to us to do that. 
I think uh, we are at the end of the session and uh, we are here for, I mean, everyone is here for the networking uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your insights, sharing your thoughts and joining us today. Uh, thank you IGA, IGEF again uh, for uh, co-hosting this uh, session and uh, back to you, Veronica, for uh, our next uh, activity. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Can we have a huge round of applause for all the ladies out here? Well, I believe uh, we women are connected by something. We all have similar, you know, similar goals, similar problems and similar solution. And uh, well, I would say uh, we are living one life, many roles and nailing each one of them. So can we give ourselves a huge round of applause? I would like to invite Mr. Devi Prashad to kindly join us. For the felicitation, I would like to invite Ms. Barbara. Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Uh, you will do for them. For the group picture. I request Ms. Rahul also to join us for the group picture. Please come on the dais for the group picture. Ms. Madhuri also, please join us for the group picture. You know, women are known for, the men are known for survival. The masculine energy is of uh, survival and the feminine energy is of uh, fulfillment. And that's what we are. We bring fulfillment to each one of us. Well, thank you so much once again for such enlightening discussion and such motivating discussion, I would say. Now I request Ms. Netra to kindly felicitate our speakers. To start with Ms. Renuka Gera. Ms. Barbara also, if you can join us for this. We are not leaving you. <laughs> Please join us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ms. Seema Saxena. Her mom just told that women should learn to be fearless. <laughs> I'm moved by it. Thank you so much. I'm kindly be on the dais once. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is it heavy for you? <laughs> Ms. Sulajja Ferodia Motwani. Give her a huge round of applause. And Dr. Rashmi. Please give her a huge round of applause. Thank you so much, ma'am, for motivating us so much. Yes, you can come uh, forward for one more group picture. Let's see with the mementos. You can, you can be a part. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. You can take your seats. Well, uh, okay. So now we will move towards the rewards and recognition. We will be celebrating, we will be awarding women driving the energy sector and we'll have uh, a list of awardees. Well, women are doing great. We've just discussed uh, 
they're just doing amazing in the field of energy not just energy you know wherever you go women are just doing great needless to say that um, you know it's out of the question to even compare even to you know check out the competition because women are doing great in all the capacities well now ladies and gentlemen we will take this moment to award the women who are driving the energy sector to do the honors i would like to invite once again mr debi prashad dash to kindly join us on the dais with once again we are calling you not leaving you ms barbara clement hagen to join us for the awards ma'am would you like to say a few words to all the women out there i've spent many years in the energy industry being the sole woman in the room and admire everyone here especially the younger women who are coming out and moving up in their careers you've you've chosen wisely in your careers and 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 um it's it's evolving in a great way and it's so nice to be in a room filled with women um it's always exciting for me to be involved in in women's programming and empowering women in our industry um so it's very nice to be here and thank you all for being here i appreciate it namaste thank you so much let us start with the awards women driving the energy sector i would like to invite ms sangamitra joyan from bhel bhel to join us well this is a gratitude to you a token of gratitude to you थोड़ी सी तालियां बजा दीजिए फॉलो बाय मिस अनुराधा गणेश क्यूमिन्स टेक्नोलॉजी इंडिया प्राइवेट लिमिटेड Let us have an applause for our ma'am. Followed by Ms. Gayatri Darish, excited. Ms. Gayatri. next we have dr rashi gupta vision mechatronics private limited next we have ms monica rati vena energy followed by ms archana bhatnagar watsila india dr surekha deshmukh tata consultancy services i triple e p e s i e s pune chapter Can we have some applause? <laughs> Next.
next on the list we have Ms. Raga Madhuri Juturu, MTU India Private Limited. I request all the awardees to step down of the stage from the other side. Ms. Namrata Mukherjee, USAID SAREP RTI International. Oh wow, I can see the joy on her face. Can we have a huge round of applause for her? Ms. Mahi Singh, Skankri Private Limited. <laughs> Dr. Abhilasha Gore, Electronic Sector Skills Council of India. Applauses, applauses, he's still walking on the dais. <laughs> Ms. Neha Jain, MG Motors. <laughs> Ms. Neha Jain. Followed by Ms. Prajakta Sabnis Urja. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Ritulal Amrop India. Ms. Ritu. Ms. Shilpa Urekar. Stalling Ann Wilson. <laughs> Dr. Shivani Sharma Hitashi. <laughs> Dr. Sarika Kelkar, KPIT Technologies Limited. Ms. Netra Walawalkar. <laughs> Badme. Okay. No, you have to do it right now. No, Netra. Netra, please. Yes. Let us give her a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Now, once you're here, you have to be here. <laughs> Ms. Bindu Madhavi, Polamanti. I saw customized energy solutions. Ms. Aditi Pathak, ISA Academy, Customized Energy Solutions. That's 
Thank you so much. You can uh, take your seats. Closing note, who is doing the closing note? I think we can...